What's up, everybody? Derek Ting here. All right, so we have a new episode of Upgrade, and today we have Patrick von Sichowski. He's a cinema guru, and he's also the chief editor of CelluloidJunkie.com. Um, and so today's topic is going to be about uh, the future of cinema and also about virtual cinema. Uh, welcome to the show, Patrick. Thank you very much for having me on, Derek. Really appreciate being here. Great. So before we dive into it, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your background, like um, how you got into cinema and, and all that. So I've kind of been on both sides of the fence when it comes to cinema. So I've been a, a journalist and an analyst writing about cinema and technology, um, starting out really when the whole shift towards digital started in the very late 90s. So, you know, when Lucas first announced that he was going to screen episode one in digital and shoot episode two in digital. And then after writing about it, I went over and, and started actually working in business development in cinema. So I helped um, switch over the first country in the world completely to digital cinema projection, which was Norway. Um, and then uh, worked for the big Hollywood studios. And I did a stint in India uh, working in Bollywood, which was you know, kind of a real trip. And then after that, I went back to journalism and consulting for CelluloidJunkie.com, which I co-founded together with my colleague Sperling Reich, who was based in Los Angeles. And I worked out of Singapore for five years, and that was a great opportunity because that's really when all of Asia, and especially China, was really taking off as a, you know, the world's big, new, dominant cinema force. So very exciting times. And now I'm back in London, you know, stuck at home like everybody else. Well, that's what I love about you. Actually, you have a great international background. It sounds like you've been around the world. Um, well, any, actually, any kind of uh, interesting things, differences in, you know, in the theaters? Just from, a, just from a general perspective, maybe not so much in the age of COVID, but. The thing is that cinema, you know, it's been around for 120 year, 125 years this year, in fact, and it keeps reinventing itself. You know, we've had every few decades, new technology come along. So we've had sound, we've had color, we've had widescreen, we've had Dolby Digital, we had then digital projection, and now we've got all these enhancements. So you get, you know, 4DX immersive seatings, you get, you know, screen X, you get IMAX. So cinema never stands still. You know, there's always a new threat from home technology. So cinema has to up its game every few decades and kind of justify its existence. Why should people pay more to go out of home and enjoy things uh, on the big screen rather than just, you know, being home and watching it on Netflix. So it's it's good time or it was a good time until COVID-19 hit, of course. Mm, that's a good point. Like, I guess, yeah, 4D, 3D. I mean, that was, you know, sort of the progression. What, what do you think before the COVID um, happened? Where do you think it was going? Do you think uh, it was progressing forward to still continuing with theaters or maybe, you know, still yeah. kind of transitioning to like the VOD and SVOD? Do you think it was still well, that way? Two two things were happening um, before the, the COVID-19 in terms of cinema's development. One was uh, it was throwing all these new technologies at the wall to see what was sticking. And the things that seemed to have an impact were um, really the more immersive type of cinema viewing. So IMAX, the really big screen, the screen X from Korea that kind of wraps around 270 degrees around you. Um, 4DX and D-Box and kind of immersive motion seating, you know, which brings you into the action. Uh, and those are especially good for younger audiences. For older audiences, there was more of a focus on service and comfort. So that means having bars and cinema, serving hot food, popcorn and Coke wasn't enough anymore. People wanted comfortable recliners. They wanted a gold class experience. So these things in parallel effectively made it a better couch than your home couch for watching the films at. And all of that was going you know, pretty well in terms of um, cinemas growing and expanding, especially in emerging markets. So everywhere from uh, Brazil to Turkey to Russia to um, Southeast Asia. But yeah, then unfortunately the coronavirus struck and all this, pretty much all the cinemas around the world shut down. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I was, I mean, you know, I, I was in the theater last summer and even my local theater uh, when I was visiting my parents in uh, Westchester, like great recliners and like yeah. the screens were huge, so comfortable. You could, you know, electrically recline back. It was, it was, yeah. it, was it was getting, I was like, wow, I actually do want to return to the theaters and keep going. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's such a shame that we're in this kind of environment right now. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about like where, 
you know, where we are right now with uh, the state of the market, um, I know it's, we're mm. trying to get back on our feet and then um, maybe some potential strategies that they're looking at to yep. lure people back into theaters. Yeah. Well, obviously when the majority of the world cinemas shut down, I mean, there was a handful of territories where they kept going. So, you know, Sweden, South Korea, and Taiwan, all the cinemas, not all cinemas fully shut down. But obviously the issue is that the Hollywood studios stopped distributing new films. And a few of those films like Trolls World Tour, uh, Scoob, and most recently SpongeBob, they went to video on demand instead. And so cinemas didn't like that. Obviously they'd prefer the new big films to come to them directly. And there was a great big debate and worry that, you know, are, if people are gonna stop going to the cinema, are all the studios gonna release all the major titles online instead? And we've had, you know, the big titles that weren't being distributed online, they kept getting pushed back. So Fast and Furious 9 got pushed to next year. Um, Bond got pushed to November. And then even the titles that were meant to um, be there for the reopening of cinemas like Tenet and Mulan, they kept being pushed back either. So, you know, from May to June, and now they're talking about August, and nobody knows if they're still going to stay there or if they're going to go back even further. So there is a great worry about what's going to happen and are people going to want to return to cinema. But now that cinemas have started to reopen, even though there aren't any new films, we are seeing some encouraging signs about people returning to the cinema. And in fact, this is a learning we've had from Asia before, because of course, in Asia, and especially in greater China, we've had the experience of SARS and MIRS when cinemas did shut down um, for extended periods. And what's interesting now is that now in Europe, some cinema chains are looking to Asia for learning. So for example, View Cinemas, which is one of the three big cinema chains here in Europe, they have a cinema in Taiwan. So they have learned tremendous amounts from what they did in Taiwan in terms of reopening cinemas and how to be able to do it safely and in a way that makes uh, guests want to feel they want to return to the cinema, not worried about being in a dark room with lots of people. So encouraging signs, but still early days, still a lot of nervousness about, you know, are people going to want to stay on the couch or are they going to say, get me out of here. I want to go out, you know, and I want to go to the big screen again. Yeah. I, I can definitely see how um, internationally people will be looking at Asian markets and how they perform. I, I think mm. actually you just published something on Celluloid Junkies about the South Korean market. That's uh, right. So South Korea has always been an, or for a long time been an inspiration when it comes to cinema. And it's for a different reason than for much of the rest of Asia, because of course you get these spectacular new cinema multiplexes in China, in Thailand, you know, in you know, Indonesia, you know, they're really surpass anything that you find in Germany or France or UK where they have fairly old and tired cinemas. Korea, however, is a different situation. They had fairly old multiplexes, kind of similar to what we've had here in the UK, but they've gone back and refurbished them. They've upgraded them. Um, they put in new technologies. You know, they invented the Screen X and the 4DX technologies, and they're forever trying to push the envelope in terms of what's possible, in terms of service, in terms of technology, in terms of new experiences that draw people in and setting a quality benchmark. You know, we have the Samsung LED screen, uh, which means you don't even need a projector anymore. It's like, you know, the most brightest, colorful, uh, big television experience, but in a cinema auditorium. So Koreans on one hand were pushing uh, the envelope on technology. Then we had the soft power of Korean culture, you know, everything from food and K-pop, but also cinema. Obviously, for a long time, we've had, you know, a great number of hits like, you know, Train from Busan and Snow Pierce and those kind of things. But now in the past year, obviously, Parasite, you know, won the Oscars, the Gold Palm d'Or in Cannes. And so this meant that South Korea was the fifth biggest box office territory in 2019. And it really established itself. And when the COVID pandemic hits, South Korea doesn't close down all of its cinemas. They're very good about, like you were in Hong Kong, about track and tracing and trying to contain this and trying to um, maintain a semblance of normality while still trying to you know, really put the brakes on the spread of this. So they kept a lot of their cinemas open. They couldn't make much money because obviously they were running out of new films and people got bored of watching the same old films over and over. So they pivoted and did things like, um, I watch cinema alone. You could rent out an auditorium for about 
uh, 100, 150 US dollars. You could rent a cinema auditorium, watch whatever film you like with up to six of your friends. Or you could connect up, you know, a PlayStation or an Xbox and play games on the big screen, which is like the totally most immersive experience when you get it on like huge screen and Dolby surround sound, you know, forget your 42 inch TV at home. That's the way to play games. So they kept innovating. And then of course, when things um, started to ease up in the rest of the world, and in Korea, they reopened a lot of uh, the few cinemas that had been closed down. The Korean distributors started to distribute some of the smaller new titles. And less than a week ago, they had the first major release, which was Lottie Entertainment's hashtag Alive. So it's a K-zombie, a, a Korean zombie film. So following on with the proud tradition of films like Train to Busan or the Netflix series Kingdom, and it's been a tremendous hit for these kind of times. So in the first day of release, which was last Wednesday, it had over 200,000 um, tickets sold. And just yesterday on Sunday, it crossed 1 million admissions. This is the first blockbuster in the COVID-19 age. You know, we didn't have to wait for Tenet. We didn't have to wait for Mulan or any Hollywood films. Korea has delivered the first true blockbuster you know, since the start of the outbreak. And I'm sure it's going to go on to be a huge hit elsewhere because, you know, the leads in it are very popular across Asia. And as we've seen from Parasite, there is an appetite for South Korean cinema in the rest of the world as well. So I hope this film goes on to distribution in other countries as well and shows that audiences are willing to come out for the big screen experience if it's a good enough new film, which it looks like this is. That's great. That's great. And so, you know, I guess they're, they've sort of laid some groundwork for, um, you know, some films that I'm excited about. In particular, uh, Tenet is one that, you know, as a Christopher yeah. Nolan fan, um, seems like all of Hollywood and the history of cinema is betting on him. What are your thoughts on, on uh, you know, uh, finding a release date and then uh, how well it's going to do and from there? Well, they've pushed, well, you're right. The industry really has pinned all its hopes to tenants um, for Christopher Nolan to save the cinema industry. You know, no small ask, but <laughs> if you ever had to pick any director, I mean, apart from maybe Steven Spielberg, you know, Christopher Nolan has said, he has, you know, proclaimed his love and his passion for the big screen over and over again. And we're not just talking about the cinema. I mean, he goes for the biggest of big screens. He shoots his films with IMAX cameras, he recommends that if you can go and watch it on IMAX to get the biggest, most immersive experience. He does not want you to watch his films on your, you know, smartphone or even on your home television screen. He's a passionate advocate for the cinema experience. Now, interestingly, what we know very likely is happening behind the screen is that there is a push and pull between Warner Brothers on one hand and Christopher Nolan on the other. He's made so much money for Warner Brothers through the Dark Knight trilogies, which, you know, of course we know, shot in Hong Kong, most memorably. Um, and with uh, Inception, which is getting a 10th anniversary re-release this summer, and all his other films as well. So he wields tremendous power. So he will be pushing Warner Brothers to say, no, I do want you to make the film come out this summer. I want it to be one of the first ones in the cinema. And I want it to be the film that brings audiences back into cinemas. Warner Brothers, on the other hand, they're looking at the numbers. They're saying, look, California hasn't reopened. You know, that's our biggest market in the U.S. New York hasn't reopened. China hasn't reopened. You know, and other territories like India also aren't anywhere near to opening. So they've added up the numbers. They've looked at how much could we make if this film comes out, especially in territories where there might be a limitation of like 25% of audience capacity max or 50%. And they've crunched the numbers and figured, Maybe we want to play it safe. Maybe we could push it back another month or two months. So at the moment, what we've had is we've had this kind of leapfrogging, which was Tenet was going to come out first. Then they pushed it back two weeks. So Mulan from Disney was going to come out first. Well, again, with China not being open and that film being fairly squarely targeted on the greater China territory for cinemas, then that one pushes back and then Tenet moves back again. And now you even have small titles like Unhinged from Solace Studios, which is a Russell Crowe $30 million um, road Rage film, which was going to sneak out before the big Hollywood films and take advantage of the cinemas that were open but didn't have new films to play. Even that one then pushed back from the beginning of July to the end of July. So we're seeing this kind of nudging back, but what we're not seeing, fortunately, is A, 
None of these films have said, right, forget about cinemas, we're going to stream Tenant, you know, or sell it to Netflix, or just, you know, worry about um, it released next year. And secondly, they're not doing a massive shift. They haven't pushed it back quite as far as, let's say, Fast and Furious 9, which took the decision of, let's move it all the way back to 2021, or even Bond, which moved back to November. So they're kind of pushing it back a couple of weeks at a time, hoping that there's going to be enough cinema screens and audiences there for when it comes out. And I think there's going to be tremendous push behind the scenes by Christopher Nolan on Warner Brothers to stick to a summer release date, even if it means coming out in the late summer, as long as there are enough cinemas open. And hopefully, hopefully then we'll see audiences streaming back into the cinemas rather than streaming at home. Wow, that's so interesting. I, I love the fact that um, he is in a position of power to push people. I mean, if that's you know, sort of defending cinema as we speak, how do you feel personally? I mean, I know you're you know, obviously an advocate and you've uh, been through many years of covering it. So yeah, what do you think? Um, I think I'm in a similar position to, to most people, which is that, hey, you know, I've been binging on Netflix while I've been stuck at home like everybody else. We've had viewing parties. Just last night, we watched Eurovision with Will Ferrell, great fun, and we've all enjoyed it, but we're kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel in terms of what's available now to stream online, and we are desperate for new films, and Bubble, we're desperate for getting out into you know cinemas and doing things that you know we used to associate with the old life of seeing friends of relaxing and just forgetting about life because the beauty about cinema is you do totally disconnect you know as long as nobody's checking their smartphone next to you you've got two hours of just forgetting everything apart from the popcorn in front of you and the big screen entertainment and we all miss that um the issue is, of course, is how safe are people going to feel going out to do that? And cinemas are making sure that not only are their cinemas clean and they're putting in all kinds of safety precautions, the staff are wearing masks, but they're encouraging also audiences to behave in a responsible fashion. And they have these new protocols really to make and ensure that people can feel safe going into the cinema. So that means you know, staggering out the screenings instead of 10 minutes between shows, they've got 30 minutes between shows so that the auditoriums can get properly clean. People enter through the auditorium and leave through the fire exit. Again, they might come in row by row. So all these measures really designed to make sure that people really know that they are being well looked after and their safety is being taken seriously by the cinemas. They don't just want their money and the popcorn. The only issue now, unfortunately, is around this whole issue of how to keep audiences and your cinema staff safe is become a ugly fight about face masks and whether they should be worn or not worn. And unfortunately, this is a thing that's come up from the US where the wearing a mask is a bit of a blue state, red state issue. You know, if you support one party or the other, you tend to be more inclined or less inclined to wear masks. And, um, and this is really a shame because as we know from Asia, you know, wearing a mask is not a big deal. You know, even before COVID, you know, people were quite prepared to do that in public if they felt it was important for public hygiene and safety. So we have to get over this big mask debate that we have in the West. And then I think that we can finally all be comfortable enough to go into the cinema, as long as we have all these other measures in place to ensure that uh, the cinema does not become a source of another big outbreak. Well, I think, I think that's a, this, is a good, um, this is a good turning point to talk about um, that uh, you mentioned about connection you know, uh, yeah. connecting with your friends and, and cinema and culture. Um, mm -hmm. And so I want to talk, uh, open up the discussion to virtual cinema. Because yep. um, I have no idea what that means. Is it a <laughs> website? Is it, you know, and then I'm watching it and then I saw it and that's it. Or is it I'm connecting with my friends or, um, mm. so I'd love to hear what that is. And, you know, you know, will it work and all that fun stuff. Yeah, sure. So virtual cinema is this phrase that's kind of bubbled up during the whole um, lockdown, the pandemic of how do we replace the cinema experience that we know and love and the way it's been for you know, 124 years now. And so we have um, a few things happening. First of all, we had the Netflix viewing parties, which is people getting together, uh, choosing a film together to watch and choosing a time to watch it all together. And then they can communicate and exchange over WhatsApp or 
the special app that lets you connect the Netflix and then have an interaction so you can switch between watching each other on Zoom and watching the film and just engaging like you would, except you really shouldn't be talking or texting when you're in the cinema, but it's okay to do it when you're at home watching Netflix. Um, the other thing that's happened in terms of virtual cinema is that a lot of cinemas were obviously missing out on revenue when films went straight to video on demand. So what's happened and started in the US with uh, Kino Lorber, a distributor, is they said, look, we have to, we bought this film, you know, Cannes or Toronto, we have to distribute it and, you know, we're not like this and we can't wait forever to put out Mulan. We have to make some money back. So we're going to put it out on video on demand. But you as an independent cinema owner, we're going to give you a cut. So if you sell the film on your website or if you stream it, on your website, and it could be a white label video on demand solution that independent cinemas have. We'll give you a cut of the film. We'll give you 10% or 25% so that your audiences can show their appreciation of you as a cinema, even though they can't visit you in person, they can still support you by buying and watching this film through your website. And this has then spread and taken off elsewhere. There's been partnerships between uh, streamers like Mubi, the art house streamer, and like I said, individual distribution companies. And what was interesting is that even Warner Brothers, when they announced that they were gonna skip cinemas for the Scooby-Doo animation, Scoob, uh, they actually had a partnership in place for some cinemas and said, look, we, we have to do it this way, but if you'd sell through your website, and a lot of cinemas, like even the big distributor, even the big multiplex in the US, like AMC, have launched their own video on demand services, usually for older films. So if they were to showing the films on their website and selling it that way, they would get a cut of 10%. The issue is some cinema chains are totally opposed to any kind of video on demand that bypasses cinema. So famously when Universal announced that Trolls was going out to video on demand or Trolls World Tour, the CEO of AMC Cinemas, the biggest cinema chain in North America, Adam Aaron, went out and said, we're not gonna play any Universal films ever which was, whoa, that's a bit of a strong statement. Okay, we get it. You're not going to show trolls when you reopen your screens, but are you seriously saying that you're not going to show Fast and Furious or the new Bond film? That's kind of a bit of a hardline approach to the kind of feeling that, okay, you're upset that you know they went this way for whatever reasons they had. So yeah, virtual cinema has maybe traditionally been thought of as something that completely replaces the cinema experience, like VR cinema, the idea that you can put on a headset and virtually you can have a 50-foot screen um, in front of you like you would kind of in the cinema. And you can do it at the same time with friends as well, as long as they have the headsets connected up the same way. But now it's sort of an in-between state that taps into what we like about cinema, which is seeing it together with friends, experiencing it as a group at the same time, and the limitations of being able to just only do it from home. But that is, um, and to, to wrap up on the question, we've seen this uh, happen in two ways. So first of all, we've got the new technologies like being able to do it through WhatsApp and VR and Netflix. But at the same time, we've also seen the resurgence of what was very old fashioned type of virtual um, cinema experience, which is the drive-in cinema. So you have effectively, you know, a self-contained little bubble of four to five people to watch the film, you know, on the big screen, um, except you do it in the midst of all these other cars. So you have a shared communal experience, but virtually to yourself and your little bubble of people. So it's encouraging that people are finding all these different ways of sharing and having a big screen experience without actually having to go to an old fashioned traditional cinema. Yeah, I love the idea of the drive-in cinema. I used to do it as a, as a kid. Um, do you think that like it's picking up and then let's say, for example, a year or two down the line, um, you know, we get a vaccine for COVID and then do you think that it'll kind of like kind of have this sort yeah, of think... the like, next couple of years or do you think it might even continue on? I think there's, people have rediscovered the nostalgia and, and the appeal of, of drive-in cinemas. Now, of course, before this, uh, in the 50s and 60s in the US, before either of us were born, you know, drive-ins is where you would go to watch new films, but now you do it more for going seeing uh, retro films in, in the summer. So you go and watch Jaws or, you know, Jurassic Park or some other classic film or, or musicals. 
and it's a fun kind of way, same as blank, beach, beach blanket cinema, you know, picnic outdoors. So it won't be a way to watch new films, but it's definitely going to be a way of uh, people going out and experiencing and enjoying old films. And I think it's here to say, especially because we've got new technologies that are making it so much better. You know, no more hanging a speaker on the side of your car window. You just tune it in through your uh, radio. Uh, also, it's not just projections. For example, in Europe, they've had a lot of drive-in cinemas where they have a big LED screen. You know, the kind of LED screens that you 2 or Beyonce would have on her world tour. Well, guess what? They're not touring now, so there are a lot of free LED screens lying about. And uh, they're not approved for new Hollywood titles, but you could definitely use them to show old films. And guess what? Suddenly, you don't have to wait for it to get dark. You can have two evening screenings, you know, one in the early evening and one in the late uh, evening. So suddenly, drive-in cinema becomes more economical if you can you know, expand the repertoire that way. So yeah, I think nostalgia... Some people will still worry about COVID. So, you know, they'll still feel safer in a car going and watching a film that way. And it's also a great group and, and family um, experience of watching it together, as I'm sure you did. So, yeah, I think driving cinemas are here to stay for a while at least. Awesome. Well, I think that's an awesome summary of what's going on. Let's, let's uh, leave it to final predictions. What, where you think it's going for anything, uh, theaters, virtual cinema, Let's make some bold statements. <laughs> okay. Um, well, cinema has survived for, um, like I said, in December, it's going to be the 125th anniversary of the Lumiere Brothers' first ever screening. No other you know, audiovisual technology has you know, made it that long, whether you think of CDs or records, or mm -hmm. it just seems to be staying. And I think that cinema is going to keep going for nothing. I don't think that VR or any or holographic technologies. I've seen some interesting demonstrations there. <clears throat> I think that some great things will be done with them, but I think cinema's here to stay. My worry is that it'll become a more of a niche thing in the future. You know, like opera has become. Hundred years ago, opera. Everybody went to the opera. You know, whether you were you know lower class and sat upstairs or upper class, everybody went to the opera. My worry is that cinema is going to become more and more niche. And in order for it not to do that, two things have to happen. We have to keep pushing the technology. We have to keep making better immersive big screen experiences. So it's wonderful when you get new innovations like Dolby Cinema coming out, where you got these incredible blacks and you got incredible colors and just the immersive sound of Dolby Atmos, which really you know, draws you into the experience. Uh, and in a way that you'll never be able to replicate in the home. And secondly, what is going to keep driving it is the fact that you have some amazing talents um, that want to tell their stories for the big screen. And whether that's you know, Christopher Nolan or whether that's uh, James Cameron with the next few Avatar films uh, or Bong Joon-ho with Parasite, um, all these filmmakers, they're not saying, yeah, you know, they might say, like, let's say David Fincher, who did Mindhunter, yeah, I'll do this Netflix series, but then they go back to the big screen. So... We're going to see more flexibility between the streaming world and the big screen world, but it's not an either or. And this is the point I want to finish on uh, for this. There have been countless studies um, about people's preferences and behaviors and likes for the big screen. And what they found is if you like film, you're going to like film in every format. You're going to want to watch it at home, but you're also going to want to watch it on the big screen. Same as, you know, if you like, you know, Thai food, yeah, you might have a takeaway at home, but you are going to want to go out to a restaurant and have it as well. And that's the same for film. The biggest consumers of uh, streaming are the people who go the most to the cinema as well. It's the people who are not interested in films at all. I don't know, maybe they like sports or other things. They're the ones that don't go to the cinema and don't really care for Netflix. So, as long as there are people who are passionate about cinema, they're going to want to consume it every which way, big screen, small screen. But I think that cinema is definitely going to be here to stay with us for, I'd say, at least another 50 years. Wow. Well, thank you so much for that wealth, wealth of information. And those are awesome predictions that um, you know, I'm definitely pushing for because I love cinema too. Um, if you're, uh, I, we got to have you back sometime. So I hope uh, subscribers out there will continue to uh, watch out for new videos. And if you're not a subscriber, please like and subscribe. All right. Thanks.